Welcome to the teaching ministry of Kungsvinger Lutheran Church. Kungsvinger is a beacon for the gospel of Jesus Christ and is located on the plains of northwestern Minnesota. We proclaim Christ and Him crucified for our sins and salvation by grace through faith alone. And now, here's a message from Pastor Chris Roseborough. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest the accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. All right, I like myself a good puzzle. Do you like puzzles? Now, I'm not talking about those jigsaw thingies. My wife does those, and I have no idea how she has the patience to do it. In fact, Dwayne Clevin once gifted her with a crazy puzzle, which she promptly finished and then sent off a photo and went, I did that, okay? I'm not talking about those kind of puzzles. I'm talking about puzzles where you have to kind of actually think it through and solve a problem, right? Um, it, when I was a kid growing up, there was a, actually it was after I was a kid. So in, uh, <clears throat> after I was done being a kid, when I was in my 20s, there was a game that came out uh, called Mist. Are you guys familiar with the, with the, with the game Mist? It was a fantastic game. In fact, um, they just recently released the sequel to Mist called Riven, and I went and purchased it in VR on my Oculus, uh, my MetaQuest 3, and oh, it's fantastic. And here's the thing, all right? Um, puzzle solving is all what that game is about. You, you're not about shooting anybody or anything like this. You gotta have to, you have to like explore, find things, put clues together, and, 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 and solve the problem so that the storyline progresses. But uh, back in the day when I would run across a game that had a pretty tough puzzle, you know what I would do? I would, I would just cheese out. I'd just go, you know, let me just Google this real quick. Give me a walkthrough for this game. And then I would be able to solve it in a few hours, right? And <clears throat> not, not a good thing. If you think about the Indiana Jones movies, the Indiana Jones movies, the, one of the things that makes them so entertainment is, in, entertaining is the fact that there's these puzzles that have to be solved by Indiana Jones. And of course, he's the guy who always was able to solve the puzzles. I think of like the last crusade, you know, in the last scene when they're finally tr this close to getting to the Holy Grail, but they've got to go through this tunnel, and all these guys are going through the tunnel, and their heads get cut off, and the puzzle, the puzzle clue is this, the, only the penitent will pass, right? And of course, Indiana Jones figures it out. The penitent is the one who's on his knees, so he goes through the, goes through the tunnel on his knees, and this buzzsaw goes right over his head, and he's able to stop the mechanism, solve the puzzle, and move on. Here's the thing. Did you guys notice just how law heavy our texts are today old testament text law gospel text law okay where's the gospel funny enough it's in our epistle text but we'll talk about this but this then gets to the conundrum and that is is that when we approach god's word and we hear god's law we think we know how to solve the puzzle let me give you the puzzle in, in the words of Christ, if you would. Jesus tells us in our gospel text today, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That sounds pretty exclusive, doesn't it? <clears throat> unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I think about the people hearing this when Jesus said these words. They would have kind of looked shocked like this because, you know, a Pharisee is like the kind of guy you'd want your daughter to marry because he was a good guy, right? But Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And so we sit there and go, ah, this is a puzzle that we need to solve. All right? And what does our training in this earth tell us? Keep in mind that God keeps order on our planet, in our nation, in our state, and in our cities through the law. First use of the law is the civil use of the law. And it goes something like this. Do good, obey the laws, and you get to enjoy particular freedoms and joys and stuff like this. Break the law, and you're going to be punished. Right? Don't believe me? Try speeding through town at 70 miles an hour on Gateway and see how long it takes for Matt to catch up with you, right? Okay, and when that happens, you're, you're going to have penalties to pay. Hmm, and you'll think this goes all the way back to our training as children, right? From the time you were tall enough to actually do chores, you know what your mom and dad made you do? Chores. Okay, the first couple of years of life are pretty simple because nobody expects you to do nothing. But then all of a sudden you hit a particular maturity level and mom starts saying things, I want you to clean up your room. Well, I've never had to clean up my room before. Why should I have to start doing it now? Well, the reason why you find out really quickly is because there's this thing called a paddle. Okay, and the paddle, it, 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 well, it, it hits your bottom if you don't do what mom says. And so there's punishments. Do good, mom, mom praises you. Do bad, dad punishes you. This is how the, how the law works. That's first use of the law. The world is governed by first use of the law. But I can tell you this. If you think you can solve the puzzle of how you can enter the kingdom of heaven by that kind of training, you are horribly mistaken. You will not crack the code. In fact, you try to save yourself by doing good, you will end up in hell. Full stop. Jesus said, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Which then leads to the second use of God's law. Second use of God's law is to show us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Okay? Okay. Don't believe me, let's just walk through the Ten Commandments here. We happen to have a handy-dandy copy of the Ten Commandments right here in our hymnal. It's on page 321. First commandment, you shall have no other gods. You sit there and go, well, I've never worshipped a false god. Hold on a second there, buddy. Um, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. <sighs> okay, um... Well, good news is there's still nine to go. Okay, maybe, just maybe, we can pull out a little righteousness here. And I would note, what are the things that we fear, love, and trust in? Money, power, entertainment, sex, drugs. You get, you get the idea. And so many people, they put their trust in these things. Did you don't believe me? Just watch a few minutes of television, and it becomes very clear that's exactly what people are doing. And here's the thing. You have done the same. Second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Here's what Luther says it means. We should fear and love God so we do not curse, swear. Ugh. Have any of you done that? Now, some of you have been in the Navy, so I'm not even going to ask. Right? Curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by God's name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. How many times has trouble shown up at your door and the last thing that you're thinking about doing is praying and asking God to help you through? Hmm, you've broken that commandment horrifically. Or I would note some of you here, like myself, we've come out of some pretty sus churches that taught some cap theology, right? And as a result of that, we, we were guilty of misusing God's name horrifically, worshiping God falsely. And worse, teaching others false doctrine in the name of God. Well, that means we haven't kept this commandment. So, um, so far, I'm batting a thousand. How about you guys? Third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred, gladly hear and learn it. I, I got to admit, the only reason I'm at church today is because I, I have a job. Right, back when I, before I was a pastor, there were certain Sundays I would wake up and go, you know, the weather is so beautiful, 
And yeah, the drive to church is so long. And, you know, if, if we just don't go to church today, I could probably get in a round of golf and be able to watch the football game when it starts at 4. I think I'm going to, I don't feel like going to church today kind of thing. None of you have ever done that, I'm sure. But you can see what's going on here. Again, I'm still batting a 1,000. Fourth commandment. Honor your father and mother. Oh, well, you know, I've never talked. No, wait, I have talked back to my parents. Oh, it gets worse, though. For those of us who are adults, Luther says we should fear and love God so we do not despise or anger our parents or other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. <clears throat> Would other authorities include Joe Biden? Have you noticed that after the debate, not a lot of people are saying kind things about him. And the fact, the things that they are saying about him go beyond whatever it is that ails him. Well, I guess I've blown that one too. <clears throat> Fifth commandment, you shall not murder. Yes! Okay, there's one. I don't know any murderers here in the congregation. Did any of you guys murdered anybody? Hold on a second here. Um, this is where our gospel text might come into play. Jesus, after reviewing the tape, uh, Jesus said, uh, you may have heard it said you shall not murder, but, who, uh, uh, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother mm, uh, will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother oh, uh, uh, will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool hi, will be liable to the hell of fire. I don't feel comfortable in here anymore. I just realize I'm in a room full of murderers. And bad news, your pastor's one too. Next one, we should all be able to breathe easy on this. You shall not commit adultery. Yes, we got this one. But do we, do we though? Um, Jesus says if you look at a woman with lustful intent in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. Ah, I guess I've done that one too. And by the way, this works for women as well. You know, just Brad Pitt, adultery. Got it? You just have to think about it, okay? Okay, you shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his possessions and his income. Wait, what? It's not enough that I haven't taken stuff from people. I have to actually help people protect the stuff that they've got? Oh, and by the way, every single time you've punched in on the clock at work and you've taken a really long coffee break. Back in the days, they would take smoke breaks. We're not allowed to do that anymore, right? And, and you've done kind of a schlocky job or maybe you're on the clock and you're, you know, texting and stuff like that. You're stealing every single time you do that. Every single time. You have agreed to work this many hours for this much money, and you're not putting in the hours. You're being distracted. You're not doing your job. That's stealing. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. We should fear and love God so we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. Well, there goes gossip right out the window. And uh, who of us can say that we've never engaged in such activity? I'm still batting a thousand. How about you guys? You should not covet your neighbor's house. Oh, forget it. I've broken that one too. <laughs> the grass is always greener on the other side. I would say and filled with less weeds, right? So, yeah, I've, I've coveted my neighbor's house. How about the 10th one? Here we have a real shot at it. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Oh, forget it. Uh, your man, his manservant, maidservant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Who needs the Ten Commandments anyway? Are you guys feeling righteous right now? I'm not. So how, how, how are we going to solve the problem? Because here's the thing. Luther, at the close of the commandments, has some really strong words that he bases on Scripture. He, it, listen to what he says. Okay, so 
What does God say about all these commandments, Luther asks. He says, well, he says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against him. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. Well, clearly, I'm not doing that. Neither are you. And based on what Luther says in the small catechism, based on scripture, what should we expect from God at this point for all of us? Wrath. Punishment. It's what you and I have earned and deserved. Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm beginning to think that we can't solve the puzzle with the law. I'm beginning to think that the law cannot save me and that not a single person on planet earth is going to be declared righteous by Jesus on the last day because they just got their act together. So how does one solve the problem? I would note, the puzzle is solved by reading the rest of Scripture and believing what it says, even if your experience and your feelings are saying, there ain't no way that's the solution to the problem. You trust the Word of God. The Apostle Paul, if you remember him before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus, and he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. He liked to brag. I would note Paul tried salvation via the Pharisaical route. And just as Jesus said, his righteousness didn't meet the standard. Paul writes in Philippians 3, If anyone thinks that he has confidence, reason to put confidence in the flesh, I myself have more. More reasons. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But can the law save you? Was the law given to save you? If a law had been given by which righteousness could be attained, then we would be saved by the law, Paul writes in Galatians. He says, whatever gain I had... I count it as a loss. It didn't exceed the necessary righteousness that was necessary to save him. At, at, what, whatever was to my gain, I count it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And it's for his sake that I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count all of my works as a Pharisee as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him and listen to the words, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. But the righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that is from God and depends on faith, there's the solution to the puzzle. You need a righteousness that isn't your own. I need a righteousness that isn't my own. My own righteousness will never get me there And it doesn't even come close to exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees. That being the case, where does this righteousness come from? God. It's given to us by grace through faith, not by works. It's a righteousness that comes from God. It depends on faith. And here's the thing. It's truly yours because it's given to you as a gift. And if you don't believe me, let's work this out with me, okay? There are two primary days that we all receive gifts. Two of us, two of them. Okay, every single year, you're going to receive gifts on your birthday. You're going to receive gifts on Christmas, right? Unless you're Jewish, then it's not, that's a whole other thing. But that being the case, those two primary days when you receive gifts, how many of you, having received a gift from somebody you love, when somebody says, wow, that's an amazing thing you have there, you say, oh, well, it's not really mine. It was given to me as a gift. Nobody talks this way, right? If somebody gives you a gift, who does it belong to? You, right? If you are a 16-year-old and your dad buys you a car, guess whose car it is? It's yours. 
That means you got to pay for the gas. You got to pay for the insurance. It's your car. You got to pay for the upkeep. It's your car, even if it was given to you as a gift. It's yours. And if this righteousness is given to us by God as a gift, and it is, then it is your righteousness. But who did it belong to originally? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to consider this. What was Jesus doing hanging on the cross? Jesus, the scripture says, he was tempted in every way that you and I are tempted and yet was without sin. Why was he hanging on the cross? Doesn't Isaiah said God laid on him the iniquity of us all? Your sin, my sin, was gifted to Jesus. And when Jesus was gifted with your sin and my sin, he bore our sins in his body and he went to the cross and he bled and died as the sinner. Your iniquity becomes his iniquity. Your sin was his sin. He bled and died for your sins. God's wrath was truly, well, satisfied by the suffering of Christ on the cross in your place and mine. But he committed no sin. He was gifted yours. So when we are brought to faith in Christ through the means of grace, God then gifts us with Christ's righteousness. His sinless, spotless life is imputed to you, and therefore your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees because the righteousness given to you was originally Christ's. And his righteousness exceeds that of any man who's ever lived on this earth. In fact, it exceeds it so much, it's perfect. And that being the case, God sees you clothed in the gifted righteousness of Christ, given to you by God's grace, then it depends on faith. Can you see it? No. Can't see it. Is it there? Absolutely. How do we know? The scriptures say so. You mean you're going to trust these words in this book, that this is how you are saved? You're not even going to try to save yourself by your works? Nope, I'm not going to do that. And now here's where third use of the law comes into play. You want to get yourself in trouble, and I know a few things about getting in trouble by saying things. That's what happens to me. <clears throat> Sometimes I, I pick the fight. Other times the fight comes to me. But the third use of the law, what is the third use of the law? Third use of the law is, shows us what a good work is. But here's the thing. If I've been gifted with Christ's righteousness, I still have a sinful nature. So do you. What does your sinful nature like to do? Sin. That's why it's called a sinful nature, right? It still likes to sin. It's the old Adam still in us. And being a Christian really is for the birds. It's kind of hard. Because every single day I wake up with two conflicting wills. The new person that I am in Christ desires to do good and to serve my neighbor. My old sinful Adam, no. My old sinful Adam cares about one person and one person only, and that's himself. And he's going to do everything to satisfy himself. And so now the conflict begins because every single day I have to wake up and my day begins with repentance and asking God to give me the strength to do the good that he would have me do and to obey his commands. My sinful nature goes, I don't want to do that. So I have to do all of my good works with my old Adam hanging around my neck trying to drag me down into something else. Here's the thing. I'm describing you also. Okay? This isn't rocket surgery. We all suffer this way. So when you hear the gospel and you're not familiar with how the puzzle is solved about righteousness, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, and you hear salvation is a gift given by God, it is 100% by grace, through faith, apart from works, people will hear that and say, oh, so you're saying we can go out and sin all we want to, aren't you, huh? You're just using the gospel as an excuse to cover up your wickedness and turn it into a license for you to go out and live recklessly. And you sit there and go, you know, I should go and get some popcorn to watch this movie because you're projecting a lot here. Clearly, you're telling me more about yourself than you are about me. But here's the thing. 
Paul knows full well that when you preach this gospel, the only gospel there is, that there are people who are going to slanderously accuse you of basically taking God's law and turning it into a license for sin. And I would note that it's not without merit to make the accusation, because here's the thing. Remember, we were talking about solving the puzzle here. There are some people who've solved the puzzle, the conundrum of, of your righteousness exceeding that of the scribes and Pharisees by watering down God's law. When I was a Nazarene, I got to tell you, being a Nazarene was tough. It was super hard, and I stunk at it, okay? But I put on a great front. I put a lot of a lot of paint on the facade of my self-righteousness. But behind the scenes, I was terrified, absolutely terrified, because I knew I wasn't living up to it. I one time went to go visit my youth pastor and told him about the problems that I was having with my own sin. And here was his solution. Well, you know, Chris, I know that this is what the law says, but God looks on the heart. And although you're not obeying his law perfectly, don't worry, God knows that, you, that your intentions are good and that you really want to. That didn't solve the problem at all because I just looked at him and said, if I really wanted to obey, then I would. And the reason why I don't is because I don't. Telling me that God looks on the heart doesn't solve the problem because the heart is desperately wicked. Other people, they'll say, well, you know, we live in the 21st century, and the people back in the times of the Bible, they were just a little too tightly wound. And I, and I know they had all these laws about certain sexual mores and stuff like this, but you just need to understand we can ignore all of that because God just wants you to be happy. Oh, does he now? God just wants me to be happy. And so they basically say, just love the one you're with. That didn't solve the problem either. That is just rank lawlessness. All right? So when we get to this good works bit, how then are we to understand it? Well, this comes back then to the means of grace. Paul, his slanderers would say, well, you're saying, Paul, that we should just keep on sinning so that grace may abound. Well, God likes to forgive sins, and he gives us all kinds of grace to cover our sin, so let's get more grace from God by sinning more. And he says... <laughs> What's wrong with you people? So Paul takes those slanderous accusations of the people who were opposing the gospel and he puts it in the form of a question in chapter 6 of Romans. So what shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? No, by no means. But then he says this, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Wait, what? When did I die to sin? Do you not know, Paul then says, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? I thought that was just a symbolic thing. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul is literally saying that when you were baptized, God did something to you. And in fact, it's not just a something. He did a bunch of somethings to you. Baptism is efficacious. It's not a mere symbol. It is not something that you do to show the world that you've made a decision for Jesus. It is something that God does to you. And so note here, in dealing with sin and dealing with that third use of the law, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with Jesus by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, here's the thing. If you believe that baptism is merely a symbol, you are not embracing the weapon that it is. And it is a weapon. Because this is a reality that is only apprehended by faith. Do you believe the words of God or not? You'll note that when you are buffeted by sin and the temptations of the devil, here Paul is saying, you are baptized. You have already died. In fact, that's the point he then makes. If we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
Well, I have, I guess, then been united with Christ in his death. And it's true, I will be united with him in the resurrection. And then he says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Can I even begin to tell you how many times I've heard people say, I just can't help myself. When it comes to an unbeliever, I said, yeah, that's probably right. That's true. But somebody who confesses Christ and who's been baptized, for them to say, I just can't help myself, you're denying the Scriptures. Scriptures say you are no longer enslaved to sin. What do you mean you can't help yourself? Why are you acting like you are a slave to sin and denying that Christ has freed you from slavery to sin? And listen to what he says next, verse 7. The one who has died has been set free from sin. Hmm. Yesterday I conducted the funeral for Linda Jean Fetterspiel. It was the second funeral I'd done in two weeks. I'd done a few this year. I, I would note that we rejoice that Linda Jean Fetterspiel is with Christ presently. And she died in the faith, confident that her sins were forgiven and that she would rise from the dead, absolutely confident of it. But that's not what Paul here, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is talking about. He's not talking about how when we finally die, we will be set free from sin. He's saying the one who has died, i.e. the one who has been baptized, because in your baptism you have died with Christ, that means you have been set free from sin. You are no longer a slave to sin. You've been united with Christ. You have died. Good way to put it is the way Pastor Swirla, one of my, Swirla, one of my pastors used to say it. Every time I sit down with an adult and tell them they're going to be baptized, I say something is going to, terrible is going to happen to you in those waters. You're going to die. And it's going to take a few years for your body to catch up. This is how he talks about it. It's not a bad way to think about it. But that being the case, if you've already died and every, anyone who's died is no longer a slave to sin, then why aren't you embracing this baptismal reality? You're saying, you're saying that God did something to me in baptism? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, I, 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 I've never heard it said that way before. When Jesus was baptized, did God do something when Jesus was baptized? Yeah, right? The Father spoke, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended and stayed on Christ. God did something in the waters of baptism with Jesus. Why would you think he wouldn't do something with you when the Scripture says he does? You can't see it with your eyes. You can't apprehend it with your knowledge. You have to believe it by faith because the Scripture says it. You have already died, all of you who are baptized. You are no longer a slave to sin, so it's time for you to live like freed people rather than slaves. One who dies has been set free from sin. If we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion ever, over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, the last verse of our epistle text. So, therefore, because you've been baptized, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Think of it this way. Have you ever been in contact with somebody who seems to be disconnected from reality? Okay. Do you feel comfortable around that person? Have you ever said these words, what color is the sky on your planet? Okay. That being the case, we note that we kind of make fun of people that seem disconnected from reality. They seem to think they know how the world operates, and clearly they don't. Right? They think they know what's going on, but clearly they don't know what's going on, okay? You're, it's not safe to be around people like that. But I would note it's not safe to be around Christians who do not recognize the truth of the reality that they have died with Christ and therefore they need to consider themselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ and that this then forms the whole basis for why we do our good works. Why do we do our good works? Because I ain't a slave to sin anymore. 
I don't have to do that junk. Neither do you. But if you don't embrace this reality, you think you're still a slave when you have been set free. And you're going to act accordingly. (sighs) How long have I droned on today? (laughs) Brothers and sisters, note this then. You have been baptized into Christ. And when you were baptized, as we confessed in the Nicene Creed, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. Your sins were washed away. You've been united with Christ in his death and his resurrection. And the implication of that is that you have been set free from sin. You're no longer a slave to sin. So when the devil comes knocking on your door and says, Hey, brother, would you like to come out and play? You say, You ain't my brother. You're here to drag me back into slavery. I'm not interested in that. And by the power of the Spirit, through faith in these words, you know then that you have been set free, so live as free people rather than slaves. And if somebody says, that's crazy, say, yeah, no. It might seem that way because isn't the gospel foolishness to those who are perishing? These words are foolish to those who don't believe them, but we will cling to them and hang on to them and embrace this reality that we cannot embrace with our senses only by faith in what God's word says. So know this then. You cannot be saved by doing the law. Christ was right, and he was right in saying that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never be saved. And thanks be to God that Christ was gifted with your sin and mine and that he bled and died in our place on the cross and that by grace through faith we have been gifted with Christ's righteousness so that we can now say the righteousness we have exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees and as a result of it we have confidence confidence that we will be able to stand on the day of judgment and hear from Christ well done good and faithful servant Not because we have been sinless, but because we've been gifted with the sinless righteousness of Christ. And then by the power of the Spirit, embracing our baptismal reality, have done the good works that God has called us to do. Because to obey God's law is freedom. To disobey God's law is slavery. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you would like to support the teaching ministry of Kungsvinger Lutheran Church, you can do so by sending a tax-free donation to Kungsvinger Lutheran Church, 15950, 470th Avenue Northwest, Oslo, Minnesota, 56744. And again, that address is Kungsvinger Lutheran Church, 15950, 470th Avenue Northwest, Oslo, Minnesota. Five six seven four four. We thank you for your support. All of our teaching messages may be freely distributed as long as you do not edit or change the content of the message. And again, thank you for listening.